On this episode of the The Cindy Podcast, Robert Sarver is bound to sell. And it's because of the point fraud? We'll talk about it. Ime Udoka got caught cheating. Like, big cheating. He got a one-year suspension. Will he be back as Celtics coach? We'll get there. I know that's what y'all want. We'll get there. Brett Favre. Scamadum Dea? Oh yeah. I've mentioned it before. But now we got all the tea. We will definitely get into that. And lastly, I didn't forget, and I'm going to make sure you don't forget, that Doc Rivers was big horny at 4 a.m. All of that and more on episode 239 of the The Sandy Podcast. El primero de mayo. Don't let Ime Udoka's horniness distract you from the fact that Robert Sarver is finally about the paint. It's been long overdue. He bought the team in 2004 for 40 M's and it's finally after 70 reports of allegations of racism to misogyny to just a uh, toxic workplace atmosphere. Robert Sarver finally seems to be getting its comeuppance. Kinda? I mean, because when you look at it, He's going to walk away with the team was valued at $1.8 billion this past year in Forbes. And because he owns both the Suns and the Mercury, it's looking like he could cash out at $4.5 billion. So a $40 million investment in 2004. Man, the team hasn't really done that much. No championships. One finals appearance. I was tricked off because of the point fraud. And then he has workplace harassment, racism, misogyny. And he's going to cash out four and a half Billy. That doesn't sound like justice to me, but apparently there are those that are giving the point fraud of all people, along with LeBron and Adam Silver, allegedly cooking up a scheme to get Robert Sarver up out the paint. Because if you remember, Adam Silver had that press conference when they finally gave their report of what they found. You know, the 70 plus allegations that were made about a year ago, they finally did their own investigation and it come to find out, yeah, Sarver did that shit. <laughs> That's essentially what the report said, that Sarver did inhabit a workplace that was toxic. He did have incidents multiple of misogyny. He did have incidents multiple of racism. But Adam Silver, quite honestly and quite transparently said, ain't too much more I can do than suspend him for a year and fine him $10 million. And that 10 million was seen to be a slap on the wrist by most. But when you come to look at it, is that that's up from what they even did to Donald Sterling back in the day. So the fact that they got 10 million in a year suspension where he has to be suspended from all basketball and team activities, that was seen to be a slap on the wrist and they were right. But the fact of the matter is, is that allegedly, if you listen to the blue check boys, Sarver was going to have to withstand not only the overtures of LeBron, the point fraud and Adam Silver behind the scenes telling him, yo, get out now, cash out, run, run for the hills. And if he didn't follow along with that program, they had the biggest joker of them all from a public perspective, Michael Jordan in the tuck, allegedly. MJ was going to come out and publicly admonish uh, Robert Sarver and influence him and just basically say, yo dogs, you need to sell the team. So let's play the game. Let's assume that what Adam Silver, LeBron and the point fraud were cooking up was really a thing, right? So you have LeBron and the point fraud publicly, and I would say more LeBron than the point fraud because we know how the point fraud gives it up as a former MBPA. We know how he gives it up. But LeBron, the point fraud, and Adam Silver had this kind of scheme where LeBron and the point fraud publicly had comments that said, this is not enough. This is unjust. This is not right. This doesn't feel fair. And it kind of pulled and made people think that Adam Silver is not good at his job. Although Adam Silver is basically carrying the water for the owners because that's the job as a commissioner in sports. No commissioner really has all this power. David Stern got away with it back in the day because he was a bully. Adam Silver, who learned under David Stern, is not that. He's just not that kind of guy. So Adam Silver was actually being raked over the coals for the first time, I think, in his entire tenure, because he's been kind of, I wouldn't say Teflon, but he certainly has been held in high regard, ushering in or helping ushering in this player empowerment era that we're in, especially in the NBA. So Adam Silver, for the first time in a minute, caught some heat. 
and it was justified. No one was out here defending Adam Silver, and you were on the wrong side of history if you were. But allegedly, this was all a scheme. While the point fraud and LeBron were behind the scenes telling Sarver, you need to go. It's that time. You know what it is. It's time to go. Especially LeBron. We know he's trying to cop a team. Hi, Vegas. So we know where this was going to go. Adam Silver gets raked over the coals. The players voice their opinions all in mass negatively against the lack of a harsh treatment or harsh punishment for someone who had over 70 allegations of mistreatment in various forms. And even after the NBA investigated these reports, it turned out that they were all damn near factual. Something had to give. So LeBron, the point fraud, and Adam Silver told Sarver, yo, we got a big joker. We got a big joker. Don't make us pull out the big joker. And if you know spades, you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't know spades, then you need to get your life together. So that big joker in the tuck was Michael Jordan. Allegedly, Michael Jordan was going to come down from the rafters because remember, the ceiling is the roof. He was about to pull up and basically tell Sarver publicly, you need to sell the team. And that was going to be the big joker to put this over the top if Sarver didn't acquiesce prior. So what did Sarver do? You bought this team for 40 million in 2004. You've been able to live a life amongst riches. You have been able to set up your family for generational wealth, multiple generations of generational wealth. Yeah. All right. 40 million. I could turn that into maybe four and a half billion. Yeah. I'll cash out. I'll go away. Fine. You guys win, right? Like that's the problem here is that Donald Sterling walked away with 2 billion. That's a win. He was misogynistic, racist. He should literally be in jail for what he's done in terms of housing discrimination, but he walked away with 2 billion. Robert Sarver, nepotism, institutional uh, racism, systemic workplace harassment, a toxic work culture, and he might be able to walk away with four and a half billion? It just doesn't make sense. How can you punish these racists for being racist? How can you punish owners for being a racist? Is there something that needs to be done prior? Is the vetting process of who they allow to own these teams need to be more thorough? Because Donald Starlin didn't just fall out of the sky with his racism, with his systemic workplace harassment, with his toxic work culture. That wasn't just a thing that appeared out of thin air. That was a known commodity of who he was. Jerry Richardson, if you want to slide over to the NFL, another guy, workplace harassment, toxic work culture, misogyny, racism, all of the above. He was able to walk out. He was able to cash out on his way out. He had a statue in front of the damn place, in front of the damn stadium. And he was still able to cash out. He was on that type of time off rip. That was not a surprise. And now we have another guy, Robert Sarver, and we won't talk about what's happening in Dallas with both the basketball and the football team, because they, those are cultures that also should be investigated. And we won't get into Washington either because we know how they give it up, allegedly. But this is who they are. These are who these people are. And there's nothing that you and I, as consumers of these products, there's nothing that you and I, as people that have helped grow the revenue in all these owners' pockets, can do about it. The public outcry was one thing, but it really came down to the fact that, allegedly, the player empowerment thing was still cooking. If you have Bron, who's the guy? Face of the league for umpteen amount of years, right? And then you had the point fraud who, for whatever reason, has been given this clout of a guy that's worthy of leadership. And then you have Adam Silver, who is the commission, has to, you know, toe the line. Sometimes he gets to side with the players. Sometimes he has to side with the owners. That's his job. He's a professional middleman. But in essence, he really reports to the 30 owners in the NBA. So what it really comes down to is how do you punish those who have the ultimate authority when they're fucking up? I don't have an answer for that, but I know it's damn sure not suspending someone for a year and giving them 10 million and is damn sure not letting someone who bought into your league as a racist, as a misogynist, as a guy that has festered a workplace environment for 40 M's. And then once they finally have overwhelming evidence outside of audio and video 
to confirm all those reports, it's not cashing out at four and a half billion. Ime. Ime Udoka. We all now know how to pronounce this man's name because he was out here big wowing. Mr. Nia Long, Nia Long's baby father, Nia Long's fiance, I guess as of right now. But I mean, yeah, Mance is out here big wilding, smashing, allegedly, the VP of finance's wife, other married women, and then doing nasty work behind the scenes, harassing these women after the fact. So Ime Udoka was caught out here, and I don't know whether it was a team that leaked it. I don't know if it was a player or players that leaked it, but there's a lot of tea that's just being thrown out here with Ume Udoka. We have footage now from the Eastern Conference Finals, Game 7 in Miami, where he's out here doing the elbow touch. And if you know, you know what that elbow touch means. You don't just do that to any woman or any person. You do that to someone that, yeah, yeah, you know what type of time. So Ime Udoka was walking away for a year. It's suspended a year. We're not sure if it's even with pay or without pay. We don't know. But as of right now, we don't know about that. So suspended for a year and there's no real confirmation that he's going to inherit and get his job back. Like there's no paperwork. The statement that the Celtics put out was almost as vague as Woj's tweet that came out when this whole first story broke. And it took Shams to just finally jump out there and say the thing because Woj wasn't trying to say the thing. I don't know if he was trying to protect those in the know. I don't know if he was trying to protect the salaciousness of what was about to drop. But apparently, Woj put out a vague tweet and it just led everyone to speculate crazy. And that's exactly the purpose of why you do that. You do that because you want the clicks, you want the impressions, you want the quote tweets, you want the retweets. And that's his job now. He gets paid, what, eight, nine million a year? Like, that's his job now. It's to jump out here, say the thing, but don't say the thing too much because you want to fuel speculation. So he drops this Woj bomb at midnight. People are hitting me up overnight because, you know, I've been in the industry for about 13 years in this sports media thing. So I'm hearing stuff immediately and then it gets quiet because it's so vague. We don't know improper what, like, what does that mean? Team violations? What does that mean? Then Sham jumps out. It just says it. Improper contact with a female team staff member, whatever the case may be. But he puts it out there that, yo dogs, he had a consensual relationship with someone, you know, that's a member of the organization. Now we're able to fuel stuff. Now it gets even turned up. The pressure cook is turned up even more. What it really comes down to is Ime Udoka was smashing women at the job. That's all it really is. Like he was out here having sex with women that were in relationships, various levels of commitment. And he was, you know, big wowing. Like there's really not that much more to it. I think there's a lot of, you know, fanfare and bluster because of the salaciousness of it. But when it really comes to it, it's just when it comes down to it is Ime Udoka was big horny. He was big horny on the job and he was able to use his position as a former player and the head coach and all that stuff. And he certainly doesn't have the same type of uh, swag as the boy genius Brad Stevens before him. So it's a different type of energy that was being thrown his way and he took advantage of it. And, you know, while we can lambast him and all of this stuff, unless we get more information because players in the media and even just ex-players in general all came to his defense immediately. And then they learned once it came out or once they were told what the real is, then they were all backtracking. Because when you look at what Woj did with, with the vagueness, then you had Shams who gave us at least the framework of what it was. Then you had the overworked and underpaid now hiding behind the paywall. Frode Smith jump out there and was trying to like allegedly put the race card low key out there. And then you had, you know, former players that are in the media now like Matt Barnes jump out there and like vehemently defend Ime Udoka. Only all of them to backtrack once they get the real and like, whoa, I know it was all that. Now they're all backtracking like, nah, man, I ain't, I ain't mean it like that because the rush to be first has gotten so much in the sports media landscape that it's crazy. Because all this Ume Odoka thing is, has proved is that one, dudes will do anything to be first. That's all that matters. Get the clicks, get the impressions, start the conversation. That's their job. Insiders 
That's their job. Be first, no matter what. Even if you have to be so vague about it that no one really knows. Even if you have to be so vague about it that people were going through the Boston Celtics organizational chart and looking up every woman that works for that team and trying to make a connection. Damn all of that. Just be first. And if you look at the details of this, and I have my phone here, so that's what I'm looking down. If you uh, look at the details of this, yo, and they learned about this in July. So again, after a finals run, after losing into the finals against the Dubs, the team learns that their coach that was their first year coach, fresh off of always getting to the Eastern Conference Finals and failing under the boy genius and Brad Stevens, their first year coach has come in and changed the format of the team, changed the look of the team, changed the rotations and lineups of the team and gotten them further than the boy genius ever could. And now all of a sudden we have all these allegations coming out. So let's get the details of what it is. So in essence, Emei Odoka had sex with the VP of finance's wife, allegedly. Then after having sex with her, who knows how many times, uh, he started sending her creepy messages. Now the VP of finance wanted to go public with this because he unearthed this because he knew his wife was cheating, allegedly, and hired a private investigator. And that private investigator began following her, tailing her, things like that. And that's how he stumbled upon, oh, she's cheating. And not only is she cheating, but she's big cheating. She's cheating on you with the coach of the team. So imagine that you hire a PI because some don't seem right. My wife is moving kind of funny. And all of a sudden your PI comes back and says, oh yeah, dog, you was right. Your intuition was correct. Your gut was correct. But you won't believe who she's actually smashing. Like she's cheating on you with the coach of the goddamn team. Scary hours. Uh, let's see. Let's go down here. More details. He allegedly impregnated someone. And Mayadoka knocked up someone. And this is multiple women, not just one, and multiple married women. Uh, the organization asked him to stop. Now, we're not sure the timeline of that. I don't know if it was in July when they first learned of this or it was something prior that kind of built steam until July when they are officially allowed to understand what's happening or learn of what's happening. So we don't know. And there's a pending lawsuit because that's what the VP of finances was going to do, apparently or allegedly. So we don't know who it is that's doing this pending lawsuit, but there's a lot here. Multiple women, not one, and multiple married women. So Idoka was that dude. He was that dude walking around just whoever he wanted, apparently. He was gaming up multiple women. Now, he's been with Nia Long for over a decade. So, you know, he finally got her to move. I mean, she just moved to Boston. She wouldn't even move to Boston last year when he got the head coaching job. So, I mean, you know, it took him a year to get her there. And now, hi, Nia Long. Welcome to Boston. Your man's out here smashing everything. There were reports that he was offered a chance to resign, that we could just cut ties completely and you could go your way, we could go our way and make this a thing and just be done with it, right? Wrap it up. But with this pending lawsuit and, you know, multiple married women and allegedly impregnating someone, why would the Celtics choose to just go the suspension route? Even though in their statement, they didn't say that they were guaranteeing him his job back once he's once this year is up. Why not just outright fire him and be done with it? Well, the answer is pretty simple because it made is a damn good coach. I mean, the boy genius couldn't get them over the hump. He found a way to trick off multiple trips to the Eastern Conference Finals. But the Doka in one year, one year with arguably the same roster, was able to get that team over the hump. So Ime Udoka clearly is talented at his job. So if the Celtics were brazen enough to actually fire Ime Udoka, there would be 20, 20 plus teams at least. I won't say 20. I'm going to say every team in the league would want Ime Udoka. But there would be at least 20 that would consider that flip right now. Like, seriously, look at the coaches we have in this league. If Ume Odoka, based off that one year we saw last year, what he, was, he, what he was able to do with Boston, which is what the boy genius Brad Stevens couldn't, one year he showed his worth. If that guy became a free agent, a free agent. In this league, yeah. Over half the league, if not the majority, if not three quarters of the league, would be behind the scenes. They wouldn't do it publicly because of the perception. But behind the scenes, trust me. They would be letting his agent know uh, how much would it be just in case? 
how much is he looking for? How many years? What's the terms? Like all of that. All of that would be happening. So that's why the Celtics can't fire Ime Odoka because Ime Odoka is a commodity, even with all of this. Because essentially, unless there's more to the part of these creepy messages, if the creepy messages turns out to be something of a harassment aspect of it, is it comes up, if it comes out to be a predatory thing, now that changes, that, that will change the dynamic. But if he had consensual sex with a, with a coworker, and then he thought maybe it was something more and then maybe the woman changed her mind or decided that's not the move or maybe felt guilty, whatever the case may be, and he kept trying to pursue, it would really depend on the level of that pursuing. Like, that's just sadly what it is in 2022. It would depend on that level of the pursuing of how we would categorize it, whether it's predatory or just man's who was thirsty and didn't realize it was a one-time thing or a couple-time thing, and then it's a wrap. Brett Favre, Scamma Demdea. Man's finally got busted. I mean, this has been out for a couple of years, but finally, Brett Favre got busted. Now, there's no charges or anything like that. It's just, it's been unearthed. It's been reported. It's been corroborated. It's been validated. It's been confirmed that Brett Favre was out here scamming $5 million from the Mississippi to M-I, crickle letter, crickle letter, I, crickle letter, crickle letter, I, humpback, humpback, I, Mississippi, pra. He was out here. I mean, how many of us know how to spell Mississippi because of that show now? I, that's the only way I know how to spell Mississippi. If it wasn't for P Valley, you could have given me as many temps as you would have wanted. I would have screwed up spelling Mississippi. I'm just saying. Am I a quick letter, quick letter, I quick letter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's now the way to spell. That's the only way I'll ever spell Mississippi. But unfortunately for Mississippi, they're the poorest state in the country. They rank 50th out of 50th in damn near every negative uh, category you could imagine when it comes to, like, affluence. Like, they just, they're lacking. They got the highest poverty level. They have the second highest unemployment rate. Like, it's just, they're down bad. As a state, by and large, they're down really bad. And Brett Favre went into the welfare fund. That was available to the whole state. That's provided by the federal government. $16 billion a year is given by the Fed to all the states to do what they will with it. And the state of Mississippi, signed off by the governor, pushed into it by Brett Favre, allegedly, went out here and took $5 million to give to Southern Mississippi, which is his, you know, alma mater, and where his daughter was going for a volleyball court. Southern Miss, volleyball. Five million dollars for a volleyball court. Nothing screams shamaturism more than the fact that you gotta drop five M's. That didn't even pay for the whole thing. I looked it up. It was over seven million dollars spent to build this volleyball stadium when Southern Miss as a program is mid when it comes to volleyball, women's volleyball. So it's like you spent all this bread just to help your daughter and the program and your alma mater, obviously, but you did it at the expense of, you know, if you do the numbers, do the math, you could have fed 8,000 people. You could have helped 8,000 people with that 5 million that Brett Favre scammed, just scammed it. And this isn't even the only thing that he did. He got over a million dollars for appearance fees to do speeches that he never delivered. The state had to run up on man to say, yo, we need that million back. You never, did, you never did these appearances. He gave the money back, but the state was asking for that money back with interest. Brett Favre, to this day, allegedly, has not paid back that interest. So this is just who he is. Mr. Wrangler is really out here just scamming wherever he can. And it's becoming a thing where, you know, if you don't know about the Drew Brees thing, I'll leave the link to that video where I told you about the Drew Brees pyramid scheme where he milked a lot of money from black and brown religious people in New Orleans post Katrina, but no one wants to talk about it. And now we have Brett Favre. We know about 
TB12 and the MAGA hat, and yeah, we won't get into that. But all these things, these quarterbacks are living their troops right in front of you. Like Drew Brees told you who he was with his movements. Now we have another one, Mr. Wrangler. Like there's a reason why he's sponsoring Wrangler. Like Wrangler? Who wears Wranglers? Think about the demo of who wears Wranglers. Yeah, it makes sense that, that it's essentially Brett Favre and you know the overrated career that he has and the compiler that he was. He fits all the stereotypes of someone who you think of when you think of who wears Wrangler jeans. There's a lot of layers here when it comes to this Brett Favre thing because it's not just, you know, the fact that he got $5 million for his automotor to build a new volleyball stadium for the women's team because his daughter's playing on it. It's even more than that because he also allegedly was looking for a $3.2 million grant for a company that he was kind of a spokesperson for that someone took $2 million to create from that same welfare fund that he got the $5 million for the volleyball stadium. So essentially, the welfare money that comes to Mississippi is essentially for whatever Favre and his mans in them want. That's what has been unearthed is that this money just sits there and the people in power just dole it out however they see fit. It's not necessarily for those that are in need. It's not necessarily for those that are malnourished or that are living below the poverty line, which is so many of them in the state of Mississippi. It's for whatever Brett Favre and his mans can cook up in terms of a scheme. They had some sort of drug that was supposed to help with concussions. And they funded this pharmaceutical company, and that's where his mans took $2 million from to fund and invest in. And then Favre came around trying to be a spokesperson for it and try to get a $3.2 million grant on behalf of this company that his mans took $2 million from the same fund that Brett Favre would later take $5 million from in the Mississippi Welfare Fund. That's insane. That's insane. And you would think, well, all right, there's some people out there that feel, you know, what well, Brett's just trying to do what he can for his daughter. He's trying to provide her the best scene or the best setting or the best of everything to fulfill her career. Here's the thing. <laughs> She's not even there anymore. Like, she doesn't even go there anymore. She transferred. She, was only, she only played volleyball, indoor volleyball, for two years. Her first two years she played. I had to look this up because I'm like, well, they had interviews of Brett Favre going around saying how, you know, the program is kind of struggling. So this facility will kind of help boost up the program and then we'll be able to get better kids in here and so on and so forth. That was the spin of what Brett Favre was trying to say is we need this facility to help build up the program. Normally it's the other way around. You bring in good kids, you bring in the money and then you can now fund your facilities and build them up. Brett Favre was trying to do the reciprocal. So the daughter stopped going there recently. Like as in this year, she just transferred to LSU. Like, so she graduated Southern Miss is getting her post-grad at LSU. Don't you think the timing is a little curious that now she chooses to go play volleyball at LSU when all of this shit is coming out? When all of this information, when all of this tea is being dropped, that your pops was really out here trying to build you a stadium just for you to play in. Your dad built you. He put his reputation, his livelihood, his celebrity, his legacy on the line for you to be able to play volleyball. Let that sink in. So she was playing indoor volleyball at Southern Miss for two years. Then she transferred over to a new sport. Would you like to guess that sport? Brett Favre's daughter leaves the indoor volleyball program to go over to, of all things, the beach volleyball program? A new Newly installed beach volleyball program. So wait a minute. Brett Favre takes five mil from the malnourished people of Mississippi to fund his daughter's volleyball pursuits. Only for her to leave two years later and go play beach volleyball? That was a new program that I'm assuming 
was another new facility? Where did that money come from? In Southern Miss. Where did they pull that money from? The vets? Where did they pull that money from? Food stamps? EBT? Disabled people? Child care? Where did they pull that money from? If, if Brett Favre has to go to the Warfare Fund to pull $5 million to go get an indoor volleyball stadium built, where the hell does Southern Miss get the money for a beach volleyball court? That's a man-made beach. When you crunch down everything that happened here, it is laughable and sad as hell at the same time because Brett Favre stole $5 million from the Warfare Fund for the state of Mississippi, the poorest state in the country of the United States. He then hooked up with a dude that also stole $2 million from that same fund to invest into a pharmaceutical company that was allegedly creating drugs that can help with concussions. And Brett Favre took that opportunity to leverage that influence to apply for a $3.2 million grant for that company. Where that money was going to go, I have no idea. I'm sure Brett knows where that money was going to go, but we have no idea. And the court that he stole that $5 million for, his daughter switched sports and didn't even play in it. This is what happens. This is the bullshit. This is where you really have to sit back and just say, like, wow, the power, money, power, respect, right? That's what you need in life. Shout out to little Kim and the locks. But when you look at what happened here, it's so clear that the people don't matter. It's so clear that the underserved don't matter. And the state of Mississippi, time after time after time, keeps showing you that they don't give a shit about those that are in need. How do you stay at near the bottom, if not the bottom, of every negative category? How do you stay there? You can have a, a slow run. You can have a, a bad run. You can have a decline. But eventually, the peak has to come. It can't just all be a continuous valley. The peak has to come at some point. But for the state of M.I., crick letter, crick letter, I, crick letter, crick letter, I, humpback, humpback, I, it's just really been scary hours for an extended period of time. That is, you have no other choice but to look to the people in charge. You have no other choice but to look at those in power. And that's why this story was so important because Brett Favre was out here skating. He was out here skating. Even two years ago when this was first reported, he was skating. Even earlier this year in April, when it was reported again, he was skating. Only now where politicians are actually having, like politicians are actually being taken to task, has this become a thing now. Now, finally, we can air this out. When people are now, some would say snitching or whatever, I would just say, some people are just saying, look, I took a plea deal, I'm out of this, I'm airing everybody out, I'm not gonna be the only one going down for this. That's what's happening now. And now because people have been caught, people have been put out there, people have been investigated, interrogated, now we're getting the full tea and the full scope of where Brett Favre was cooking up. And it's sad, it's deplorable. It's, it's really a testament to how much of an overachiever he is, that he is still even past his prime. Let's not look past the sexual assault with Jen Sturger, allegedly. Texting dick pics, allegedly. Let's not look past any of that. All of that stuff was there, and they still prop this man up. Now we have way more examples of, you know, one per harassing one person isn't akin to taking food out of almost 8,000 people's lives. But this is who this man is. He is living his truth. And it is deplorable. It is despicable. And Brett Favre, I mean, he was never high on my list anyway. He was overrated for a long period of time. He was a compiler for a long period of time. That whole gunslinger thing was more of a thing of John Madden's love affair for him than us as a society actually embracing what this man does. How many QBs do you know reference Brett Favre in terms of who they looked up to? How many of this era will mention Brett Favre in terms of I study tape of him? I don't hear that. I hear Peyton Manning, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, those guys, Marino, Elway. I never hear, oh, I studied Brett Favre. 
So if QBs know, then maybe we should too. You know who's really happy about this Robert Sarver thing? About this uh, Ime Udoka thing? About this Brett Favre thing? It's got to be Glenn, right? Your man's Glenn Doc Rivers has to be ecstatic that all of this is going on because we have other NBA horniness to worry about. We have other NBA racism, misogyny to worry about. We have other NFL welfare scamming things to worry about than Glenn Rivers being horny at 3 a.m. That's what on the cusp of training camp, we are now finding out that Glenn Doc Rivers is big horny on the cusp of training camp. And now we can all be quiet about it. The Sixers have confirmed that he was hacked. As if the Sixers really have a way to confirm that Glenn Doc Rivers was hacked and not really out here being big horny 2 a.m. on the cusp of training camp. Thank you, Philadelphia 76ers IT team, for unearthing that Glenn Doc Rivers was indeed hacked and not just big horny. Thanks. And on the cusp of training camp, he's going to get questions about not only being big horny, but he's also going to have questions of Ben Simmons is making the rounds. He's making the interview rounds. He is speaking. Ben Simmons is actually talking. And he's opening up about how he was treated those last couple of months in Philadelphia. And Doc Rivers is looking bad, according to Ben Simmons. I mean, Ben talked about the fact that when he was going through his mental health stuff and his back stuff and all of that, that... You know, he was trying to be open and transparent with not only the team doctors, but with Doc Rivers himself. And he thought they came to some sort of understanding that, you know, he would take it easy. You know, he showed up to practice and he got kicked out of practice. He talked about that incident specifically. And he was like, well, look, prior, I told Doc what it was. I said, I think I could give it a go in terms of I think I can participate in practice. And Doc said, all right, well, we'll work you in. And Ben showed up, was a part of the team, so on and so forth, was part of the camaraderie. Practice started, and within one minute of actual time, Doc Rivers, big horny at 3 a.m. on the cusp of training camp, told Ben, all right, get in there. And Ben was like, dog, you said you was going to work me in. Like I told you, I think I could give it a go, but out the gate, one minute in, nobody's even worked up a sweat. We haven't even gone up and down once or twice. You trying to throw me in there? So he felt he was being set up for failure. He felt he was being sabotaged. And when you look at the history of the people that's in charge there, when it comes to Doc Rivers, when it comes to Daryl Morey, I mean, there is something to that potentially. There is. I mean, Glenn has sabotaged many things before. He sabotaged the Orlando Magic from getting Tim Duncan because he didn't want you know, Tim Duncan's wife and family on the team charter or to have access to the team charter. He did that. He sabotaged the the franchise of the the Orlando Magic. He did that. That's a thing that happened. So I'm not surprised if Glenn was cooking up a thing to make Ben look bad and to make Ben either choose himself or the team, which either way, Doc wins, right? Because if Ben is forced to just play, even though his head's not right, then the Sixers have a better chance of winning because he's just that good of a player. But if Ben chooses himself, which is what he did, and got himself kicked out of practice, all right, well, now we don't got to worry about this Ben thing no more. We can jettison him and then eventually move him. We don't got to worry about this no more. So either way, it's a win-win for Doc Rivers. So he just put the pressure, put the screws into Ben Simmons and made him choose. You're going to be for the team or you're going to be for self? And if you know anything about Ben Simmons, more than likely, he's going to be for self. So big horny Glenn Doc Rivers is going to have to answer a lot of questions in regards to Ben Simmons and his comments. And I think this is not something that was taken lightly by Ben. I think this was also calculated in the timing of this release. Now, I don't know when it was recorded, but it seems like a pretty peculiar timing to make sure that when these big horny likes come out, that within a few days of that and within a day or so of the Sixers claiming that it, or confirming that it was a hack, that now we got Ben Simmons out here bringing up Doc Rivers again. So while the Sixers have done everything to acquiesce, not just Joel Embiid, not just Glenn Doc Rivers, but also the Beard and James Harden, I mean, they basically brought all the Rockets that tricked off that 3-1 lead to the Doves back in the day. They brought all of them to Philly. Like, that's supposed to be a thing. What, P.J. Tucker, who else they got over there? Like, they just brought all the dudes, 
all the dudes are there. They're going to bring back Luis Scola. Did they, did they find, did anyone find Luis Scola? Is he around? I don't know what happened there. The timing couldn't be better for Doc because he was caught big horny, two, three, four a.m. liking porn tweets and no one seems to care about it now. So while we're going to be going into training camp and people are going to have Ben questions, of course, because he's making the rounds and the timing seems a little, little peculiar that these quotes and these, these video drops are coming out right on the heels of, you know, Glenn being big, big horny out here. But no one seems to think about it no more. No one seems to care anymore. It seemed like it was just like a quick 24 to 48 hour news cycle. Not to me. You're, you're a coach of a professional franchise and you're big horny on your phone at 2, 3, 4 a.m. liking porn tweets and then you're going to use the old excuse of I was hacked when that's been proven to be such a lie in 2022. Like who, who even still uses that? Like we see people liking crazy stuff all the time. We know when someone's actually being hacked. Like people will do dumb shit with the timeline. They'll say stupid tweets or they'll tweet out something that's so counter to who that person is. Like that's how we know people are hacked. You're telling me someone hacked into Doc Rivers' account between the hours of 2 and 4 a.m. and all they did was like some porn tweets? That's it. They didn't drop no N-bombs. They didn't drop no defund the police. They didn't drop no MAGA shit. They didn't do any of that. They just... Oh, I'm going to go in here and just look up some horny shit and just like it. That's it. If you hacked Glenn Doc Rivers, an NBA player who made a good amount of money, an NBA coach who has made even more money, that has a championship ring, finances out, out, the, out the whatever, the only thing you're going to do if you hack his account is just like some porn tweets? Give me a break. Like, it's 2022, dog. No, that was you. You was big horny. You was big horny, but no one cares. No one cares. And I tell you what, you better win this year. I mean, you're not going to win, but for your sake, you better win this year because it's either you or Maury. And if I'm ownership and I got to choose between the dude that called out China and got chastised for it and is basically taking whoever he had in Houston and bringing it here or the coach who has tricked off a bunch of playoff leads that has tricked off dynasties in Orlando and Boston that is tricked off not knowing how to handle a roster of grown men throughout his career and he's out here liking porn tweets at three or four in the morning no 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 give me Maury give me Daryl Maury that's who I'm going with all the time so Doc you better win you better win this year because if it's not it's curtains for you you know what it is Appreciate y'all for listening. Uh, again, this is a this is a different thing we're doing here. We're doing audio and visual now. So please tap into the YouTube channel if you haven't already. Subscribe, all that good stuff. Turn on the bell for notifications, all that stuff. But if you just look at listening to the audio version, continue to do what you do. Subscribe and rate to this podcast, whether you're on the Purple app or the Rogan app or whatever other app you're using in between. Make sure to spread this. And uh, if you haven't done so already, social media. Wherever you need to find me, the Sam D Podcast. It's up on the Elon app. It's up on the Zuckerberg app. And it's also on TikTok, the China app, I guess. So, you know, I ain't hard to find. I'm out here. I'll be in the comments. I'll go back and forth with you. I really don't care about that. I got all the smoke. I do not duck any smoke. So I appreciate y'all for listening. We're going to do this weekly from here on out as we got the NBA coming back. We got the NFL in full swing. This one was more of a analytical, just reacting to breaking news type uh, episode. But going forward, we're going to be breaking down games, bringing on guests, getting back to what we do on a normal basis. So for the Sandy, this is the, the Sandy podcast. I'm out.